not spreading fast from what's believed to be the world's biggest financial swindle by one person. The rich, the famous and some serious banks have lost billions of dollars to Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff, this week, 150 years in jail. What did you think of that? Just not enough. It would be too hard. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Some people are saying, well, maybe these investors were perhaps a bit greedy. But I think he was basically saying, I can get you 10% every year. Now, year after year, that's unrealistic. But it's not outrageous, is it? And the other thing I was struck by was a number of wealthy investors who you'd think would know better, who put all their money in this one investment. So Presumably people... they had advisors advising them as well, who, who completely got it wrong. Oh, absolutely, but there was a terrible story of this family where they put the whole lot in with Madoff. Hi, I just wanted to check on some investment bonds I have with you. Certainly. Look, what I need from you is the bond number. Do you have the statement with you? Yeah. OK, if you look on there, there should be a bond reference number. If you can just give me that, we'll uh, sort this out for you. There's nothing there. There's no bond number? No. OK, let me have a look in our system. Just one moment, I'll just uh, have a look for you. <laughs> OK, there, there seems to be no account number with your name. There's no bond investment account under your name. That phone call began a chain of events which unravelled Stephen Vasalko's nine-year double life. She had the feeling that there were some similarities between the way Mr Madoff was um, acting towards investors and the way Mr Vasalko was um, acting towards her. He betrayed everyone's trust, his family, his investors, and his employers. Oh my goodness, Stephen, look what you've done. You're not nice, you are a despicable human being. I knew nothing of what he was doing. It's just ruined my life. He'll get out of prison and he'll have to make his way in the world, uh, but we won't forget him. family man, he had wife and teenage children and lived in East Auckland, a very comfortable life. Well, he was just Stephen, the nice person who looked after my money transactions, and he was just very, very pleasant. He had a sort of sixth sense for making investments and, and for making money, which not everyone is attributed with, but he was, he had a, just a knack for it. Prior to working at the ASB, uh, Mr Vasalko had a lot of experience in um, money markets and swaps and options and that kind of thing. Um, he worked at a lot of banks, spent some time overseas, uh, and generally uh, was very clever and uh, very skilled at what he did. He was very highly paid in those earlier jobs, and we know that when he took the job at ASB, he did suffer quite a substantial pay cut. All right. Hi. Mm, how was your day? Great. How was yours? Oh, it was good. Oh, good. Do you want to talk? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. a certain kind of lifestyle and then, uh, it's fair to say, perhaps didn't adjust as well to earning less money. Vasilko. Hello, Stephen. It's Melanie. Melanie, hello. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Listen, the reason I'm calling Stephen is my investment is um, maturing um, fairly shortly. Well, I've been thinking about what I can do to, you know, make my money make more money, 
for me, and so I just wondered if you had any ideas for me. Mr Vassalco undertook a property development project in 1999 and he needed some money to uh, see that through to its conclusion, uh, otherwise he would have had to either sell up or borrow from somewhere else and perhaps it exhausted those loans. So needed around $70,000 to make that happen. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will have a big think about it and I'm sure I can absolutely find something to help you. I look forward to hearing from you then. Bye, bye. The first client who lost money through him, they'd had a, an ongoing uh, relationship uh, in terms of him looking after her money. Uh, she lived overseas and relied on him to really run things for her here in New Zealand, which um, you know he did a very good job at doing. And on occasion she travelled to New Zealand, he sort of went the extra mile and, and would pick her up from the airport and take her to where she needed to go and set her up with a, an ATM card and that kind of thing and really go the extra distance, which you know she appreciated and engendered a lot of trust between the two of them. Hello, Melanie speaking. Hello, Melanie. Stephen Vaselko, how are you today? Well, thanks. Now look, um, Melanie, I'm ringing you today because I have some very, very good news about your investment. It's um, very exciting news actually. It's called fixed interest investment, which means you have a favourable interest rate, uh, tax benefits, we take care of the tax, you don't have to worry about that, we pay it for you. Uh, your funds are on call so you can uh, get access to your money at any time and what's more important, you're on a better interest rate. The, the thing you'd have to do is just uh, send the authority over to me to action it, but other than that we're away. My urging to you would be to take this uh, fantastic new offer. But the thing is, you know, it's your money so you can um, stay with the old scheme if you like. Well, I trust you implicitly, Stephen, so great, go right ahead. That is fantastic, you have made an excellent decision. Have a fantastic day. Then because Mr Vasalco had the authority because of his position at the bank, he was able to transfer that money um, from her bank account into bank accounts that he controlled. In the, the meantime, um, he obviously had to cover up the fact that he had stolen the first investor's money, and he did that by producing false statements. investor didn't realise that, that anything was, was out of the ordinary. She received her a statement saying that her money had been transferred from her bank account into a new investment account and therefore she was quite happy with, with her investment. And from there he was able to take the $70,000 um, and cover his loss on the residential property development. In my opinion, Mr Vasalko crossed the line. Immediately he stole the first amount of money that he did. Uh, and the first transaction where he stole money was for $70,000. And then about a month later took some more of the same amount. And then a month later took a smaller amount. So that was the initial way he kicked off the scheme. Now, to be able to walk away from the scheme at that point in time, Mr Vasalko would have had to have some other source of income. It was unlikely that that money was going to come from his salary, therefore he would have had to have some other windfall gain to be able to replace that money. So let me try and explain a Ponzi scheme to you. Imagine that I'm an investment specialist, or I claim to be an investment specialist, but I have no money, I have no customers. So I invent a fictitious scheme whereby I offer 
a 50% return on an investment. You come to me with $1,000 and I offer you 50% offer you return in one week. So that means in one week I'm going to, I'm going to have to pay you $1,500. So I take your $1,000, but instead of investing it, because there's no way I can legitimately invest it and make a 50% 50, 50 return, I blow it. I take my wife away to a spa for the weekend. One week comes round, you come to me saying, well, where's my, where's my $1,500? So I need two new investors to pay, repay you. So I acquire two new investors. They each give me $1,000. So I've, now I've got $2,000. I give you your, your $1,500 and I buy my wife some nice laundry and some perfume. In a week's time, those two investors are going to return and say, well, you owe us our $1,000 plus our $500, so that's $3,000. And if you multiply that by 1,000, then you're in Versalco territory, you're talking millions. And the thing is that there's no legitimate way of making that good. There's no way short of a lottery win that I'm ever going to be, be able to repay all the investors. Unfortunately, what happens is, is it's unrealistic for it to continue for a long time because it collapses under its own weight. I guess the most famous one recently has been the scheme operated by Bernard Madoff in the United States. In 2008, he confessed that his investment firm had actually been operating a Ponzi scheme. He's now currently serving a 150-year sentence in the United States. Ponzi scheme fraudsters are confidence tricksters. They're con men. So they're selling themselves as much as they're selling the product. Fraudsters in general have many commonalities or, or traits in common. Um, and Stephen Vasalko is no exception to that. Oh. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I trust you implicitly, Stephen. You've never put me wrong yet. Go right ahead. That will be because of the um, the, uh, the shorter month um, in, the, in, the, in the statement period. Now, it is your money, so uh, you can leave it where it is, but I highly suggest you take this deal, which means you have a favourable interest rate, uh, tax benefits, we take care of the tax, you don't have to worry about that, we pay it for you. And government guaranteed. Government guaranteed. Well, that's good. Safe right. Services. Well, I'll yeah. think for half a second. So, for a fraudster like Versalco, who has his own particular set of characteristics, he in turn will look for a particular set of characteristics in the sort of investors that he's wanting to take advantage of. speaking. I started working at the Pelican Club. A friend of mine there told me, you know, you put an ad in the paper from home, you don't have to pay the shift fees, etc. And Stephen answered my ad. Hello. We had a chat. He just asked me to describe myself, you know, my height, hair colour, blue eyes. He said he liked the sound of me and when can I meet? So we made an appointment. The first payment that Mr. Vasalko made to the first escort that was a major beneficiary of his Ponzi scheme um, occurred in 2001. Um, that was approximately one year after he stole the first amount of money. On a typical visit from Stephen, I'd make sure the garage was up for him so he could drive in, put the garage down in case someone saw him. At first, when I first met Stephen, it was once every fortnight that I saw him, and it turned into once weekly, maybe twice a week. But he was seeing other girls as well at the time that he'd tell me about. Hi. Hi. There you go. Pastries. He was likeable, yes. He was likeable, so, charming. He's going to the roof, actually. It's, uh, yeah, we did share laughs and have a good time. Yeah. You know, he was just like any other guy. Until you get to know them, you don't know what they're like. 
fantastic. I have to say, I've been to the uh, I've been to the Pelican a couple of times, and a couple of um, new girls there. Yeah, you know they're uh, they're they're nice, and they know what they're doing. Look, let's settle this up now. Oh, look, he look. always paid by cash, yeah. always. Like what he's paid on his credit card that you know about, everyone knows about that. I'd say would only be about. 10% of what he's actually spent because he did say he likes to spend mostly cash because it can't be traced. When he left, I used to have a hot shower, make myself a coffee, and have a smoke. He probably was very different to me, to me personally, because, you know, I knew the sexual side of him, total different side of him, and then when he went back to work and he was Mr. Straight Man, he used to phone me just to see how I was, you know, without seeing me. He'd just ring me and say, you know, how are you today, how's your day going? He just seemed to, like, make an effort. I did respect him in the beginning. As I got to know him, more things has kinkiness started to come out and that was weird. Some of his weird ideas and people he saw that did kind of change my feelings a bit. Well, it started off at about 1.50 an hour, which is the normal hourly rate, but when he got into other kinky stuff, it went up maybe 250. Oh, next when he was with me, his phone would ring and he would answer the phone like 50% of the time. Hello, darling. I thought that was a bit, oh, well, a bit no, odd. I'm in a I wouldn't have answered yeah. it myself personally. Uh, all right. Next time. Drive safe. <laughs> what a, a, a man or woman wants want to do in that regards is as their own business. But in his case, he was using other people's money for his ill-gotten goodies, whatever, and, and paying high prices just to appear the big, the big man. At some point, investments that were previously represented to clients would have been maturing, or if a client, for example, decided they wanted to extract money from their investments for the house purchase or similar, then uh, Mr Sauco would have to find those. So the first instance we see of having to pay some money back would have been about 2003 when an investor needed an amount of cash. So at that point, that was reasonably manageable. He had enough in there to be able to do that. I've got some bills to pay. I need about $3,000. But as the scheme wore on and more and more people needed money back, the interest payments were due and that's when it started to get a little bit unmanageable. So therefore, to cover those payments, he needed to attract more and more money into the scheme. Um, and therefore, he stole more and more money um, to be able to make these repayments. He'd established relationships by being good at his job, basically. And obviously, he had a lot of clients who didn't afford that he had good relationships with as well. So um, he, he was uh, knowledgeable and uh, was able to explain things very easily to people, which is a bonus for some people who aren't as uh, savvy with money as others. And I guess found some common ground with each of them. Steve, that lovely to see you. <laughs> Hello, yeah. everyone. Lovely to see you too. Here we go. Oh, oh for you. Oh, how <laughs> lovely. You do know my taste. Yes, I know you like that great. <laughs> well, he was just Stephen, the nice person who looked was, after my mummy transactions, yes. and he was just very, very pleasant. And I just that, took him at face value, because why wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. A new investment opportunity has just come up. It's called ASB Investment Bonds. The most fantastic thing is it's an 8% interest rate. How much? 8%. Good I know. It's the highest around, as we like to reward our loyal clients. Well, you can transfer it straight away. We can do it today if you want. Of course, you, you don't do have, have to. Do I have to sign anything? Uh, no, you can give me the authority verbally. And government guaranteed. Government guaranteed. Well, that's good. Safe right. Houses. Well, I'll yeah. think for half a second. Um... Why not? That's a wonderful decision you've just made. <laughs> right. He would ring up and say, I think it's time we discussed the money situation again because I suppose something was falling due. He would take me out to lunch. Well, I say, it didn't happen a lot, you know, perhaps once every six months. 
could we have uh, your best champagne? Oh. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> really? I know. And we sit there and just talk about excellent. everything uh, and, and nothing in general. Uh, not that I want to go on about it, but I'm just uh, thinking with your investment, we could just maybe um, roll over for another year. How do you feel about that? But let's talk about it later. Let's, yeah, a little Didn't bit talk more. much about the book work because everything just sort of kept rolling over. And, and I didn't query anything because, quite frankly, I had nothing to query. He became a friend. And I suppose now... He would sort of mentally tick me off his list and say, she's fine. Buying personal satisfaction, that kind of thing is what drives so many of these people. Where the person sees themselves as better than everybody else. And they get to the point they, they know they're succeeding. They've taken an investment here. They've taken an investment there. They're getting a win. They get the profit. And then they start thinking, well, I need to pay me for I'm doing really good. I need to pay me. I need to get a, a little trip here. Hey, I've met a, someone who's a prostitute. I can get a deal going there. And so it goes on. They tend to judge their life and their future around themselves. They don't see it with other people. It's very much focus on yourself. One of his offences that sticks in my mind um, is that he was contacted out of the blue by an investor who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. One of the lures that Mr Forsalco used to, to attract investors was that their, their funds would always be in call, they weren't tied up. Um, this investor needed his money back quickly to distribute to um, relatives. Um, and this panicked Stephen Versalco. Um, it was an inconvenience to him, he needed this money straight away, so he needed to get another investor to pay off this early investor, which is a hallmark of a classic Ponzi. He had two clients, he approached them. Stephen. <laughs> yes, good to see you. Yeah, good, good to see yeah. you. Thanks for coming. This oh, way. Thanks very much. Great, Great to meet you. you. Nice to meet you too. Very nice to meet you. Please, thanks. Oh, thank you. Well, gentlemen, the good news is I can offer you the interest rate that you're wanting. Now, this is the best deal in town. It is the most fantastic deal you're going to find, and I'm um, offering it to you first. Now, it is your money, so uh, you can leave it where it is, but I highly suggest you take this deal, as it is the um, uh, probably the offer of the year, to be honest. It does sound like a great deal, so I can't see any reason why uh, you wouldn't go with it. And he took their money on Christmas Eve. Cheers. Oh, Merry Christmas. Same to you. Because of the almost unlimited funds that he had at his disposal, Mr. Versalco was living a lifestyle that most of us can only dream about. He was living in a beautiful house. He had a batch at the seaside, bought cash. Children educated privately. A wine collection worth 300,000. Money simply wasn't um, a problem for him. He didn't need to think about how much he was spending. He would just do it. Over the period of his offending, he had seven credit cards, and they were with a variety of financial institutions. And on some days, he used the multiple credit cards to withdraw the maximum amounts on, on multiple occasions on those days. Mr. Vasalko's expenditure was significantly more than his salary. So he was living well beyond his means. Nice little drinky. I don't know how you do it, darling. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, you, you know, the, the CMC markets I told you about? Yeah, well, they're, they're overnight are fantastic. He traded with a company called CMC Markets, which is a company that allows their clients to trade in financial products. Mr. Vasalko uh, invested some money with this company and did his own trading in these financial products. Um, and it appears from our financial analysis that he was quite successful at doing that. And we believe that he told a lot of people that he was trading successfully with CMC Markets, which would explain a lot of his spending and, and lifestyle. It's the challenge. Let's take it to the next stand. Let me try a little bit further. Let me drive my opportunities just that little bit further. The game that gets 
more and more complicated. Look, Cam, I'm a bit of a bit of a hurry today, so I um, might um, get some. Yeah. Towards the end, he seemed pretty frustrated. But when he used to come and see me, he used to be well, seemed on edge, and he wouldn't even stay an hour. Just wanted it over and done with. He'd like his relief, and then he'd go. Sometimes he was gone in 15 minutes. I suppose all this stuff was building up towards the end. You know, maybe he knew he was going to get caught or something. The gambling problem started probably around 2004, and it just got out of control. I'd spend anywhere between 1,000 and 3,000 a night. Yes, Stephen told me to try and stop gambling, yes. That's very hard to do. How the relationship between us ended, well, he told me he wanted to stop seeing me. I did previously tell him beforehand that I was going to stop working because I've had enough. Um, he did tell me to give him a call if I did get into trouble, which unfortunately I did. Stephen Selko. Hi, Steve. It's Esther. How's it going? Oh, hi. How, how, how are you? Yeah, good. Uh, well, I, I, I just want to spend money. And how much do you need? Oh, maybe, maybe just like five grand. Um, yep. He I, used I, to I, say I, that I, just give me a couple of days and I'll sort it. I'll just sell some shares. He was like a knight in shining armour. He could help me. But towards the end, when I was asking for a bit more money than normal, I think that, yeah, he was getting stressed. There was a reference on one of the transactions from Mr Vasalko to the escort where Mr Vasalko had written in a bribe which appeared on her bank statement. Well, he, he rang me and we talked about that and he said he was sorry he put that in. It was just a try not to ask him for so much money. And yet I rang him a week later and asked for more money and he put money in, not a problem. There was always a threat that one of the escorts might have contacted Mr Versalco's family. And although that threat was never made overtly, as far as we, we were aware, perhaps both parties, Mr Versalco and the escort, knew, and he was prepared to, to pay her money just to, to hush her up. But I wasn't bribing him, like he said, and that just made me so upset. I was actually upset first and then angry. I never gave him any indication ever that I would tell his wife. As if I'd be telling her, I don't want her on my doorstep and we didn't find any evidence of bribery occurring. Um, and furthermore, there was never uh, a complaint laid to the police um, that bribery had occurred. Mine and Stephen's relationship ended in 2005. Uh, a sexual relationship, that is. But we did keep in contact over the phone over the years. And apparently he met another lady at the Pelican Club that he took to Dubai and other shopping trips and, what, gave her $10,000 for clothes or something. And I was probably a bit peeved off that he didn't take me away. Yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. just having a little holiday going up to Auckland, either going down to Christchurch or Queenstown. This is, let's go for a good one. It's getting bolder and bolder and bigger and more daring and, of course, with a whole lot more of um, fringe benefits, shall we call it, for a lack of a polite term for taking your hooker with you. It's... It is a compulsion. It is, in a sense, an addiction, isn't it? The second escort who was a major beneficiary of Mr Vasalko's Ponzi scheme, um, she received her first payment in approximately 2007. Is that all right? Yeah, well, what are we going to... Um, look, sorry to... Could you just... Oh, sorry, could you just hold for one sec? There's got another call coming through. Hello, Vasalko. The unbelievable part Hi, is he yes, still no, had to no, earn no, his salary at the ASB, still bring in legitimate customers, still have money turned over. 
Plus, he had to deal with the 26 other customers who uh, he was fiddling and using their money. How he didn't get the whole thing, I don't know, mixed up, it's unbelievable. Okay, okay, bye. Look, sorry, Bill, about that. We uncovered several mistakes that he made that if uh, more knowledgeable people um, about investments um, were involved, they may have recognised. Stephen Vasilko. Hey, hi, Stephen. It's uh, Timothy Patterson here. Hey, look, look, I'm just going to query on one of the statements you've sent me. It seems that the uh, interest has been calculated incorrectly here. It should be for a period of 92 days, but you've only done it over a period of 90 days. Well, it's just the latest statement you, you, you've received. Yeah, that's the statement I received yesterday. Oh, well, that, that would be because of the, um, the, sh the, 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 uh, the shorter month um, in, in, the, in the statement period, and um, that's... Uh, that's clearly some sort of technical error. I see that it, it, it absolutely comes right. One investor walked into a branch of the ASB Bank who had just purchased a property and needed their investment funds to be able to settle that property. So how do you get on? I faxed all that stuff through. Yes, there was. I just, I'm not able to find a reference number on here, and I have looked in the system, and I'm not able to find your name in there at all. Look, I have absolutely nothing else. This is all I have. Now, look, the reference number, that's not my problem. I have a lot of money involved here. Did you remember who it was who you were speaking with? Sure, it was uh, Stephen Vasilko. I sorry to do this to you. Well, you might just hold me for one sec, sorry. We've got another call coming through. Hello, Vasilko. Hi, hi, Stephen. It's um, Matthew at the front desk here. I have um, Mr. Johansson. Sure, sure. Steve's just on his way down. Thank you. Oh, good evening. Steve, how's it going? Yeah. Well, I hope we can get this sorted. You guys don't seem to have a record of my uh, investment. Yes. Right, Matthew. Sorry, Steve. I, I can't actually find a reference number for um, Mr. Jahansson's account. Um, I've been through the system and there's no. Oh, oh, oh right. Uh, look, no, look, uh, this will just be a, a minor mistake. I'm sure we can sort it out in a minute. No worries. Look, uh, sorry about this. Look, I'll come to the office. We'll, um, okay. we'll sort it out. No worries. Yeah. Right. Look, uh, um, how, how's the family? Oh, they're all good. And the person at the branch saw no need, or really had no need, to, to follow up because he thought Mr Vasalco, investment advisor from the ASB, is, is now going to handle the, the issue. No. This is unusual. Look, um, I'm sure it's something we can straighten out. If you can just let me know who you dealt with with regards to this. Stephen Vaselko. Stephen? Oh, look, I can just put you through to Stephen right now. No, uh, no, excuse me, I don't want to speak to him. Can you put me on to somebody higher up, please? I have three million dollars invested in these bonds. Okay, I understand you're a little concerned, Sally, so I'll just put you through to the ASB security, and I'm sure there's someone who can help you there. OK, Sally, just one moment. So once this investor had spoken to someone at the ASB, uh, that triggered uh, uh, some scrutiny on that investor's accounts and then they were able to see from, you know, quite easily that Stephen had moved significant sums of money into accounts he controlled. Hey, Stephen. Paul Barnes, Internal Fraud Investigation Team. Can I have a word, please? Come on. Stephen. Let's think about the impact on the Vasalko family. I don't know these people directly, but one wonders. Firstly, there's a prison sentence, and that's four years minimum at least. There's no doubt of guilt. That's an admission of guilt. There's shame around that. There's hurt around that.
Something's happened. It's not the kids, it's not the kids. Just stay there. I was reading The Herald on Sunday and saw his picture and then I started reading and I was just absolutely shocked. I just never thought he'd do something like that at all. Wasn't I wrong? I was scared when I first read it. Well, I knew I'd be investigated because of the money in my accounts. In fact, I was terrified. I was trying to hide everything from my family and because this has come out, I've had to open up and tell my whole family what's going on, what happened and what I used to do for a job. After what he said about me, I hate him. I do. Just for the lies. Just hate him. Why, why did you lie and say I bribed you? Because it's not true. If he was here, I'd probably smack him in the face. Couldn't believe it. Could, I, I just could not believe that Stephen, that nice person who was the so-called friend, could could have done that. Couldn't believe it. It's not just the, the dollars that these characters got away with. It's all the faith and trust in the good side of people, and and that it's a the world is a, a safe and reliable place. I'm sorry, got it wrong this time. Once he had been found out once he was confronted with the evidence, he didn't attempt to, to deny it. Um, and he came into the office and he, he explained how it was he'd gone about committing the fraud. At that point, we hadn't had the opportunity to look at every investor's statements and accounts. You know, we were still amassing that information, so we relied on him quite a lot from that interview. And to that, to that end, he was, um, he was very good. So he was cooperative to the extent that um, he didn't attempt to deny it. But then you've got to remember that he didn't. He didn't confess, he didn't front it up a police station and say, I've committed a, a terrible offence. If he hadn't been caught at that stage, then he would have gone on. In a letter to the ASB, Mr Versalco explained how anyone could have, could have committed this crime, and I just don't buy that. That's bullshit, Mr Versalco. That just reduces every New Zealander to the same level of moral inadequacy as him. There are thousands of New Zealanders working in positions of responsibility who are equal to the, to the task and discharge that possibility without question. He consciously chose not to. Nobody made him do it. That's an outrageous comment. The ASP did repay all the funds that were stolen. They also honoured the investments that Mr Bissalco had promised to the investors involved, uh, which means the ASP will continue making interest payments and the maturity payments out to, I think, 2014 is the longest investment uh, that Mr Vasalko had promised an investor. Uh, so they felt great support from the ASB. As an ASB customer, um, I'm concerned that 
to know what went wrong here um, and how they've fixed it and it won't happen in the future. And I'm sure clients of other trading banks want the same sort of assurance. And unfortunately, with the ASB not revealing what's happened here, to some extent the, the banking industry gets tarnished out of that. And also the financial advisors get tarnished because to some extent this is being treated as a rogue financial advisor who's ripped his clients off. And from my perspective, that's not the case. This was a rogue employee who ripped his employer off. I think some of the lessons that the, the general public should take from, the, the, from this case is that you always treat an investment as, as business and not personal. Here we go. Oh, for you. If you are offered guaranteed returns from an investment, you should be quite sceptical of an investment of that nature. And government guaranteed. Government guaranteed. Well, that's good. Any investment has some element of risk to it. And also to be very concerned about secret investments, investments that are privileged. I'm only offering this investment to you because, and you can't talk about it because it's secret. In terms of the one investor that, that finally twigged, she acted on just a real gut instinct and that something didn't sit quite right with her and, and there's certainly no harm in that. You know, these people are there to provide a, a service to you and if it means you've got to ring up once a week, so be it. Um, it's your money. If possible have internet access to be able to check your uh, investment online. And I think the other thing to be concerned about is to be very aware of a relationship with an investment advisor where you are not given the opportunity of contacting somebody else in the organisation or in another organisation. Sorry about this. Look, I'll come to the office. We'll, um, okay. we'll sort out no worries. Yeah. Talk to someone else. Get a feel. Be very careful. Don't assume that what's being offered you by something that's really good is necessarily really good. It might not be. Everyone's heard of Mr Frisalco describing himself as Mr Invincible. What happened was that quite early on in his interview when he was busy apologising, for what he'd done rather than explaining um, what he'd done. He described it as he was um, taking this money, stealing this money, um, living a, a high life. He felt like he was Mr Invincible. And it, it struck me that by the time he came to be interviewed by us, sitting in a room with a camera in front of him, knowing that he was facing years in jail, he probably didn't feel like Mr Invincible anymore. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand On Air.